So, my fellas, what's up, baby? I wanted to get a little sappy real quick, and I wanted to say that by the time this episode airs, you two yeah. will have been groomsmen at my wedding, and I just wanted to thank you so much for not embarrassing me on my special day. I can't wait for you to eat these words. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be Chris fine. Gonna... Nothing's going to go wrong. Yeah, it's going to be a day of loving and compassion. And the bonding. first uh, the first wedding I officiated, the house they rented where the, the ceremony was at, there was one rule, and it was don't jump in this pool. I'll let you guess what happened. Did you jump in the pool? <laughs> yeah, I jumped in the pool. 100%. <laughs> so what happened? I don't know. Some lady came out, and she squatted in front of me, and she said, not cool. <laughs> but it you were cool though I that know. was the thing yeah did I you just, do it with, uh, with like with ray-ban sunglasses on there no there was one other guy i don't know it was a mess anyway um speaking of messes welcome to wiki wiki <laughs> what this is oh. our uh random knowledge podcast uh that'll probably teach you something whether you like it or not uh, my name is dana my name is chris and i'm jake oh, on this show <laughs> I did it. I didn't, you know, I listened to episode five where I had that really long pause between your name and my name. <laughs> and you just decided, not a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it was a really long pause. I totally understand why you guys are laughing. Um, so, uh, on the show, we read Wikipedia. We find articles all starting with the same letter. We keep those articles secret from each other till the time of recording. We learn about them and hopefully commit a bunch of it to memory. <laughs> and uh, come in and teach each other about it, and then we tell some jokes. We sure do. Uh, so we're going alphabetically. We We've all picked the same letter. This is episode eight, so that means our letter is G. No, d- no, no it's dude, it's H. Oh no! Oh wait, no, I did do H. <laughs> I did H. Um, so <laughs> what we're doing is. Uh, do you want to try that again? With no, no, no. Up? I like it. <laughs> Are you sure? You don't want to rewind and... 100% don't okay. care about mistakes. <laughs> Just roll um, on through. Yep. So uh, we're going to do a little uh, preview of our, our choices and vote on who gets to go first. Um, I nominate Dana to go first. Of course you do. <laughs> um, so my clue is just a very short alliterative clue. Um, and that clue is activity animal. <laughs> And that's all I'm going to give you. That's pretty great. Yeah. Activity okay, okay. animal. There you How go. How about you, Chris? Go ahead. Uh, mine is a person who um, their occupation, I'm going to leave one of them out, but they're listed as a actor, a television personality, an entrepreneur, and a musician. Okay. All right. And for me, I am going to tell you why many people achieve very little despite spending most of their time. Oh. That's so real. That's so mysterious. Um, it could be anything. So what, who, what, are you, what are you guys voting for? Who's going first? Uh, uh, I vote for me. I do too, actually. Okay. Uh, I really like the way that you voted for yourself, too. Uh, we you need did to like that, that jerk move in like your class election. <laughs> Well, I mean, Jake, if you want to go first, if you're like really it's raring two, to do it, it's two against one. <laughs> okay, all right, start. Okay, it, start it up. So, what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is horse ebooks. Excuse um, me, horse ebooks. <laughs> okay. Um, so, horse ebooks was a widely followed Twitter account and internet phenomenon. Uh, the account was apparently originally intended to promote ebooks, but became known for its unintentionally amusing non sequiturs in what seemed to be an effort to evade spam detection. <laughs> so it was this Twitter account. I mean, it still exists it's at Horse Ebooks. Um, but it would regularly post uh, like once every four hours 
um, these random bits of strings that looked like they were pulled from books that uh, were sold uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. And it would create tweets uh, that would just be random strings, some of them up to the character limit, some just a few words. Um, And some people observing the Twitter have described some of the tweets as strangely poetic (laughs) <laughs> and cryptic missives that read like Zen Cohen. So this was this was Ooh. created as a as an sort of artificial intelligence like project or um I'll <laughs> I'll get to okay. it. Okay, all right. I mean, I so, know a little bit about this topic cuz you and I have talked about it before, but Yeah. Um, so Yeah, can you give me just one example of what in the world you're talking about? So I'll give you five examples. <laughs> I can't wait. So Examples include of the Zen Cohen ones, uh, or not necessarily a Zen Cohen, but some of the uh, more popular tweets uh-huh. were things that said, I'll make certain you never buy knives again. Whoa. Or, we all agree, no one looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't agree. I don't agree with that at all. Is the dance floor calling? No. <laughs> Everything happens so much. And... <laughs> Unfortunately, as you probably already know, people. So people would see these like just spam after spam after spam, but every once in a while the strings would line up right. and it's just like really nice little sets. The planets would align just um, for a moment. And uh unlike many other Twitter spam accounts, horse ebooks didn't employ uh strategies where they would like mass follow and just send unsolicited replies to random Twitter users. And because it didn't use these typical spammer techniques where like it would occasionally create like appropriate things and it didn't do all these weird things with invites and retweets, uh, it didn't get closed by Twitter. Huh? Um, it flew under the radar. And, right. So uh, many of the followers of the Twitter were gained by word of mouth and, at the heyday, it had somewhere around 200,000 followers. Yowza. So, on September 24th, 2013, it was revealed that horse ebooks uh, had been sold in 2011. What? To promote an alternate reality game developed uh, for viral marketing towards an art project and release of a a series of interactive videos hmm. about the 2007 subprime mortgage financial crisis. I didn't know about a, that. Yeah, it was in a project called Bear Stearns Bravo. What? So the very last tweet that Horse Ebooks did was in 2013. Uh, it was, well, the last two tweets were a phone number and then the words Bear Stearns Bravo, and it hasn't tweeted since. Oh, this is creepy. So, yeah, so it's got... It still has 180,000 followers, even though it hasn't tweeted in almost three years. Or actually now over three years, because now it's September 28th. Huh. Um, so, Horse Ebooks was named as one of the best Twitter feeds uh, by Yugo Networks in 2011, and Time.com in 2012. This was prior to, <laughs> uh, what? you know, the, the what reveal. Was their, what was their scaling um, <clears throat> like criteria? Or what was their, their grading criteria, rather? I didn't really best, look into just that. Like but three dudes, if they liked it. <laughs> they said it was the best. Best um, feed. Okay. <laughs> John John Herman at Splitsider wrote that Horse Ebooks might be the best Twitter account that has ever existed. <laughs> this guy And loves uh, it. after the fictitious nature of the account was revealed, The Atlantic uh, named Horse Ebooks the most successful piece of cyber fiction. Huh. So mm. even still, people are pretty stoked. Um, so while I think that alternate reality games are pretty interesting, um, I, like a lot of people, were pretty disappointed to find out that horse ebooks was being operated by a human. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, f- I sort of felt like over the course of reading this, cause I was like reading it in 2013 right. when I knew, yeah. like I was in it, you were I was subscribed, in there. I loved it. I was, I was posting about it on Facebook. I was liking and retweeting cause I thought that this robot was like, Becoming um, sentient. It was just like self-learning. Well, I just, you know, if it had been choosing random text strings, I thought that it had these really rare moments of clarity and lucidity. And it was like really serendipitous, right? Uh, it made me believe in magic. 
<laughs> but like knowing that they were like curated by a man and he was like trying to sell me like a video, uh, I didn't bummer, it, dude. Made me feel kind of upset, right? This is this is like one of those situations where I feel like I have no actual understanding of the way the internet or viral marketing works because I don't understand how this was number one as popular as it was or how you would leverage this into making money. Well, it is a good news that you have subscribed to this podcast because I have like 15 more minutes of information Ooh, about I alternate love it. reality. I games. love it. I love it. Um, I also like your so, phrasing of it is a good news. It is a good news. <laughs> Can we cut that A no, that's out? Not, no, that's no, actually going to be the title of the episode. They're going to become the name of the episode, exactly. <laughs> it kind of sounds like a horse ebooks tweet anyway. <laughs> it is a good so news. So we're fine. <laughs> All right. So alternate reality games. Uh, are sometimes described as the first narrative art form native to the internet because the storytelling of these reality games relies on two main activities conducted on the internet, which is searching for information and sharing information. Um, And because these are the two main activities uh, done to interact with the game, the developers of alternate reality games have created some core rules for the creation of the games that most of them adhere to. So it's it's a pretty short list. Um, so the the core tenets of ARGs. Storytelling is archaeology. So when you're playing an ARG or creating an ARG, you don't tell everybody all the details in order. What you can do is you can create story artifacts and allow the players to collect and reassemble them hmm. uh, however they need to to play. Uh, you want a platformless narrative... Uh, the stories aren't bound to a single medium in an ARG, so you don't have to like revisit a single web page or like go to a forum or like go to the same place every time. Uh, parts of the game can be anywhere. What was that one that Halo did? Was that was like something to do with bees? Was it was it Halo? Yeah, yeah. Um, I I actually talk about that later. It was called I Love Bees. Yeah, that's uh-huh. and they they created this uh, like kind of like corrupted simple web page about bees and it was like a place where you could like allegedly buy honey or or something like right. that and and it, and it ended up being um a viral marketing for Halo 2. That's right. Um I'm right. surprised Chris doesn't know about this. I don't I didn't do any of this. I played like games. What are you talking about? You were di- so into Halo. Yeah, I was Southern California Regional Champions for Halo 1. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's very, very modest. <laughs> That's good, dude. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. No problem, boys. All right. Uh, design goal number three, design for a hive mind. So in ARGs, when people get together and play it, most of the time they form a community and they find each other and they mm-hmm. figure out who all is playing. And uh, because everyone is in it, they're real tight knit and the, they have a key goal of like beating the game. So... It's not really competitive. It's really collaborative. So Uh all of the information that most people know is shared quickly throughout the community. And because the communities are so large, it's very likely that individuals within a community will possess every conceivable area of expertise. So if you're playing or creating an ARG where you need somebody to just like know some weird language or be really good at solving puzzles or do cryptography or something. It's really likely that somebody within that community is going to be able to do it. So even if the individual player can't, the community can. So you can basically just go with the craziest thing you can think of because somebody will be crazy enough or skilled enough to understand what you're throwing out there. Correct. Uh, philosophy number four, a whisper is sometimes louder than a shout. So Mm. ARGs rarely ever promote that they are happening. Uh, so they don't try to get people to play by being like, Hey, come do this thing. Instead, they'll just do some real subtle marketing that somebody will catch on to. And they'll be super over the top, uh, in terms of secrecy and they will avoid a traditional marketing media. So instead they'll like do some kind of like weird graffiti or like, posting a flyer somewhere that people go but only somebody with like a really observant eye might catch on to right or they'll do like subliminal messages in other media so 
Uh, design number five, the this is not a game aesthetic. So the games never acknowledge that they're games, and they don't have established rule sets for players, and the players themselves determine the rules through trial and error. Um, and the narratives of the game present a fully realized world. So if you're ever playing and you encounter something where you find like a phone number or an email address or a website or something, they will all work. Um, and the game uh, takes place in real time and like certain events are not replayable. Hmm. So uh, the characters that you interact with in the game function like real people and some events involve like live phone calls between yourself and actors or, and things like that. So there'll be people to answer the phones and get back to you in real time. That's super interesting. Um, so uh, number six, what is it, six? Yeah, real life as a medium. So games use players' lives as a platform, and players are not required to go build a character or pretend they're somebody other than themselves. So you don't have to, like, log into a website or create huh. a character. Yeah, super low commitment. Like, You're just kind of in you, it. Right. You play as yourself, and, like, you don't do, like, what is in a traditional, like, RPG where, like, you put points and skills or whatever. Like, whatever yeah. skills you have in this game are based on the life that you have lived up to the point where you're playing the game. Uh, so you might overcome challenges that other people might not because of the knowledge you possess or the background you have. Uh, and also, you... also, if you die in the game, you die in real life. Oh no, <laughs> absolutely for real. That one. You die for real. Um, so participants are also encouraged to constantly look for clues embedded in everyday life. So similarly to the last rule, clues exist in real time, and it's possible to miss them uh, if you're not paying attention. And, you know, some clues are based on geolocation. So it's possible that if you live in California, you won't have the game same game experience as somebody in Europe ah. or or whatever. So they don't, like, put the same clues everywhere else. So they really encourage uh, community. Huh. Collaborative storytelling. Uh, the owners of the game control most of the story. However, they will incorporate player actions into the game and respond to analysis and speculation, and they'll like adapt the narrative based on like how successful the community is being. Mm -hmm. So, if you are like solving like one half of the puzzle and like neglecting the other, they can like change the way that it's working and things like that, and just kind of make it uh, make it more reactive. Kind of make yeah, the world reactive game design. And it's then like uh, the last one is. Uh, that it's not a hoax. So even though all of these rules are in place to make it seem like it's part of your reality, like there are some s subtle or overt meta communications to let you know, hey, it's just a game, right? So some things uh, that have been promoted by alternate reality games. Blair Witch Project. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh, Halo 2. Right. The movie AI, there was like a series of like games that came out on PC that kind of like led you um, to get really upset when <laughs> Haley Joel Osment's mother dies again. <laughs> no. Dude, that movie makes me so upset every time. I can't watch it. It's, um, it's the movie that ended four times. Yeah. Like there's yeah, so you many were, points where oh it just God. should be done. And I was like, oh, man. Oh, no. Another there's, 20 minutes. There's more things. <laughs> what do you mean there's aliens? Yeah. <laughs> um, that alien, that robot, what happened? Uh, so in 2007, the Why So Serious campaign was run to promote the premiere of The Dark Knight. Right. So this is when you started finding all of those like $1 bills with the Joker stickers stuck over George Washington's face with the like the blacked out eyes and the smiley face or the, you know, like the red lips and stuff mm -hmm. and like those weird I love Harvey Dent stickers uh, everywhere. Um, I really thought you guys were get, gonna engage me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2013, a game called The Secret World launched. It's an MMORPG. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can play it on Steam right now. Yep. Uh, you play as a member of a secret society. You get to choose uh, between the Illuminati, the Templars, or the Dragon, which is what? some kind of Asian themed uh, Illuminati. I think the game <laughs> itself. Uh, includes solving like cryptology puzzles and stuff so huh. the fact that they like had an arg where it happened and then you just keep playing the game and keep doing it seems pretty appropriate that's cool. and then uh in 2010 
Valve updated Portal on Steam, and they added like a nondescript new achievement and some WAV files hidden in the game. Oh, yeah. And uh, the files contained some Morse code and some encoded images. And when you like figured it all out, it created a 32-bit MD5 hash of a phone number. And if you access the phone number as a bulletin board system, it created some large ASCII art images, which led to the announcement of Portal 2. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, I do remember, remember Portal that. Portal 2? That was fun. That's the game yeah. with the the pill, the suppository, and the eyeball. Uh, what? Those robots? They look. One looks like a suppository, and one looks oh, like an eyeball. Okay, yeah. So I mm. thought I was going super <laughs> literal there, and oh, <laughs> you were like, I don't remember that I part was like, of the alternate <laughs> reality game. Yeah, it was an alternate reality game where you like took a suppository and like jammed it into to, somebody's eye to bed. <laughs> <laughs> The end. ARG. Yeah. ARG. <laughs> your, um, your new alternate reality is you are in prison. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so what if an ARG wasn't necessarily a game, though? Oh, God. I know. The Matrix. So, The Matrix. Um, so, uh, Cicada3301 is a name given to an enigmatic organization that on six occasions has posted a set of complex puzzles and alternate reality games to recruit code breakers from the public. So uh, the stated purpose of the puzzles each year has been to recruit highly intelligent individuals, um, though the ultimate purpose of the Cicada group remains unknown. So this is is this a recent development? So it started in 2012... Um, with the first one, hmm. and uh, they've continued, I think, through the last four years. But um, so some people have claimed that Cicada is a secret society with the goal of improving cryptography, piracy, and anonymity. Hmm. Uh, but others claim that it's a cult or a religion. Oh, that would be um, so cool. So the outcome of all four rounds of the puzzles have remained a mystery the final known puzzles like get really 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 complex like as you go through and uh like certain anonymous individuals have claimed to have won but verification from the organization was never made and the individuals making the claim haven't come forth with any information that would indicate that they have won i just i just looked something up and this might be a crackpot theory but edward snowden uh, did his first uh, leak to uh, The Guardian in December of 2012, and you said this started in 2012. What if he's recruiting? Ooh. Mm. That's what it is. What if? I'm certain of it, guys. Tin foil hats on. Tin foil hats off. I think you cracked it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Take that's that what off. you do after done. you after you verify the. Uh, that's scandal. enough. Honestly, that's <laughs> enough for me, dude. <laughs> I'm an American. I just I just gorge myself on falsehoods. <laughs> so, an email was reportedly sent to some individuals who completed the 2012 puzzle, revealing that those who successfully solved the puzzles were giving a personality assessment, and those who passed that stage were reportedly admitted into the organization. But again, Nobody there's no real detail. Knows. Nobody knows. So, uh, the Cicada 3301 clues have spanned many different communication media, including internet, telephone, original music, bootable Linux CDs, digital images, physical paper signs, pages of unpublished cryptic books. Um, So, you have to use, like, all these crazy techniques to encrypt and code or hide data, and the clues reference, like, a wide variety of books and poetry, and music, uh, things like uh, Agrippa, Book of the Dead, and like ancient Anglo-Saxon runes. So I want to know. I want to. Like, how do how do people know that people that are following this ARG or this this situation aren't just injecting red herrings into the process? Like, how do they know it's officially coming from the source that they're? Do you know what I'm saying? Um, like, how do they that, know that? That's where those. That's where those meta communications come okay. in. Like, if the game 
identifies that people are trying to like mess with the game, they will be They'll like, step no, up and say, fake. okay, all right, all right. All right. Huh. So there's all this like crazy stuff where you have to know like runes and you have to like reference all of these old philosophical stuff like Carl Jung and you have to read the Kabbalah and like you have to know all of these weird ciphers and figure out all this stuff and there's like physical clues that have been hidden all around the world. So as the group uh, gained notoriety and public attention, uh, people asserted that the puzzles are an introduction to occult principles <laughs> and uh, possibly even recruitment for a cult. For and the I mean, I yeah. guess it makes sense if you take a look at all of the things that they're referencing. It sounds culty, um, yeah. Yeah, so... Dr. Tim Daly, a senior research fellow with the Family Research Council, analyzed the teachings of Cicada 3301 and stated, The enigmatic cicada appears to be drawing participants inexorably into the dark web of the occult, a la Blavatsky and Crowley. Oh my god, that's so cool! Um, Right. So, at the heart of the enchantment is the counterfeit promise of an ultimate meeting through self divination. Oh. Um so this guy's analyzing all the puzzles and he has summarized what he believes of the group's core beliefs. So there's no inherent meaning in anything and all is empty and meaningless. Within each person is an ideal state akin to Nietzsche's Ubermensch. Uh hmm. the existence of an emergent godlike global brain is made up of all living things and technology. Uh, there is no need for salvation because there is nothing from which we must be saved. Ugh. There is no real reality, and what we perceive as reality may be a simulation. Okay, you got. You might need to stop soon. You are spooping me out, dude. Yeah, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, the use of their term intelligence rather than person seems to indicate the belief that uh, they believe there may be a simulation or that we are sentient artificial <laughs> oh, intelligence. No. Um, and many of their writings focus on uh, the belief of ego death. And uh, mm. some believe that these puzzles are a modern and technological equivalent to the Enlightenment journey that was done through uh, Western esotericism huh. and mystery schools. So uh, prior to this, the thing that I was getting real spooked about... Um, was at the bottom of the cicada page. There was a link uh, under the C also. It was called 11B-X-1371. And I clicked it, and it is a name given to an early 2015 viral video of unknown origin. Uh, and it had a screenshot of this guy in a super spooky mask, and I got scared. <laughs> and I'm going to show you. And now you're in a cult. And now I'm definitely going to die uh, for all of this stuff. They got a, um, like an apothecary mask on. Yeah. That's it for me. You did it. <laughs> I'm not clicking. I'm not clicking that. Horse ebooks. Okay. <laughs> Great job, Jake. I'm officially spooked out. Horse ebooks. <laughs> I was hoping that it was like My Little Pony fanfic, but. It was not. So what? I'll do that one. Next. What's what is next? Who's going? Yeah, who's gonna yeah, go? Jakey. Who do you want? What were the clues? Uh, mine is, uh, mine a is man a... who is an actor, television personality, entrepreneur, mu- musician, not a magician. And uh, my clue is alliterative because the topic is alliterative, and that clue is activity animal. No, oh. I want to hear. I want to hear that one. I need something to. You need something to take you out of the darkness. I need something to bring me back. Let's now. go. Let's go with this adorable activity animal. So, um, I might not be able to do that very well because my article <laughs> is hobby horse. Okay, which oh, is related. Apparently, we're going to do horse topics. Wait till you get to mine. <laughs> you could also take the British pronunciation with it, which is. Obios. 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 I, I, I will. I will. So, do you guys want to take a stab at what a hobby horse is? Um, no. Is it a? Uh, it's somebody who's very uh, uh, into their like hobby, or collects hobbies. Nope. 
Uh, so the term. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're you're partially right. Uh, that is actually where we ended up. But the term oh. hobby horse is actually used uh, principally by folklore people to uh, refer to the costumed characters that are featured in traditional seasonal customs, processions, and similar observances around the world. Um, oh. So if you've ever seen uh, old uh, illustrations of like a guy that's got like a suspended costume where like there's just like a horse looking thing at his waist. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, that's a <laughs> that's a that's a hobby horse. Um, can you can you describe that a little better, please? No, uh, I'm about to go into sort of how they're constructed, so maybe that'll be uh, more enlightening. Uh, they're associated particularly with May Day celebrations, uh, Mummers plays, and what's called the Morris Dance in England. Uh, but hobby horses are used all over the uh, European world. Huh. Um, there are a couple different constructions for hobby horses. Uh, there's things called tourney horses. Uh, Which are basically, like what I described, are meant to look like a person riding a small horse that's wearing kind of like a long loin, like a long cloth coat. Uh, Uh And they build this sort of oval-shaped frame that hangs from their chest or their waist. And the skirt sort of drapes towards the ground. And this wooden horse head extends out from the front. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. And they have like a tail attached at the back. And usually that tail is made of actual horse hair. Uh one of the creepier things is that the head has this little pull string that can operate the jaw of the horse head. So, Ugh. so that's a tourney horse. Uh, sieve horses are just a smaller version of that. Uh, the most creepy version, though, is called the mast horse. And these are uh, meant to represent the animal itself. So they, they often have an actual horse skull at the end of the mast, which Why? has a hinged jaw that can just snap at you, essentially. What? Yeah. So, that's the thing. Um, <laughs> not all hobby horses fit into the, those three categories. Uh, in fact, the most famous ones that are like still around today uh, are operated in Padstow and Minehead in the UK, and they're like huge. They're like almost like parade floats with like tiny hmm. little horse heads on the front. Um, in southern France, some hobby horses are actually large enough to be carried by multiple performers. Um, so imagine like a <laughs> boat, like a boat with like a tiny little horse head on the front, and that's today's hobby horses. Um, <laughs> so one of the interesting things was just like, what are the customs you know involved in these hobby horses? Why are they around? Um, uh huh. As I said before, they're they're famously related to seasonal celebrations in Britain. Um, in in Padstow, Cornwall, uh, they have this huge May Day celebration called the Obios Festival, um, <laughs> and uh-huh. there are two rival horses in this celebration. They have Ooh. the Old Oss, which is represented by red and white banners, and the mm-hmm. Blue Ribbon Oss, which is represented by blue and white banners. Um, both horses are followed around by a band of loyal supporters and kind of egged on by someone called a teaser who like, runs around <laughs> waving this padded club to try and antagonize the horses in what, sh- in, in what I can uh, only assume is like something similar to what matadors do with bulls. Yeah. Yeah. And like all, during all this, there's musicians playing with accordions and drums and uh, they're playing uh, Padstow's traditional May song. So, yay May! <laughs> I love I love that song. Yeah, you love it. That's my jam. Um, one of the more weird rituals um, at the at this particular event is that sometimes the horses and it says capture young women beneath their skirt. What? And then the the girls will emerge covered in like a black smear. <laughs> what what is it? So I don't I dove a bit deeper because I didn't understand what was going on, but I guess. This was an old medieval pagan ritual to bring uh, the girl fertility or good luck. Another custom in uh, Devon is called the hunting of the Earl of Roan. Um, hmm. It was so this particular custom was banned in 1837, but then revived again in 1974, uh, where they now <laughs> they now practice it. You know, regularly over the four days of their spring bank holiday. Um, 
essentially what happens is a fool and a hobby horse followed by uh, people dressed as grenadiers search the village for the Earl, capture him, mount him onto a real donkey and parade him around. Um, He's frequently shot at, falls off his mount. What? And is then (laughs) revived by the hobby horse and the fool only to be put back onto, onto the mount, taken to the beach killed and thrown into the ocean wait this is real yeah. life like murdery a man chris obviously the people of devon aren't really murdering an earl but i know nothing they they're, used they're, to it they're makes me like, black splooge on them it makes me That's why it was wonder banned. about all the years leading up to 1837 because in my opinion that's still too recent to be doing routine executions on national holidays nah man it's like the purge it yeah. is the purge. They they figured it out before us. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go through the, these next ones a little quicker, but another custom on the Isle of Man, which is that like largish island between the British and Irish islands, uh, has a man carrying a hobby horse called the White Mare and running mm. into houses and chasing girls out into the street. <laughs> This sounds, life they live sounds terrifying. Uh, once the white mare captures a girl, she is required to take her place under the sheet, go back into the house, and sit in a corner by herself. Get on a <laughs> sheet. <laughs> so, what? so then they do this like sword dance, and there's some fiddle music, and then they pretend to cut the fiddler's head off, and the fiddler is oh. then blindfolded and he's led to the white mare and he kneels down with his head in her lap and then they ask him questions about the future and i guess these are supposed to be believed to be true predictions just a a fiddler period uh, or whoever is playing the fiddler i I, like i said my goodness these are probably being done as more just of like you know recognizing the heritage i don't know yeah yeah there's not a lot of stuff but it's just still like it's kind of interesting uh, how how they differ within the UK like yeah through these different towns because back then it, they were so far apart it took you know tons of time to travel between them but like there's just a lot and of this variants. this this uh this one with the on the Isle of Man with this white horse that rams buildings and captures women yeah. is 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 this one of the giant parade ones or is this more likely a man driven one it's no it's, i i think it's a a smaller a smaller okay. activity. Um, I had I had a, a great <laughs> image in my head of a giant like like a like it's a, just a like boat a big size. crane attacking buildings and scooping <laughs> up women, <laughs> just crashing through like the Kool Aid Man. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, nah, no, nah, th- this is I think a little bit on a smaller scale. <laughs> um, yeah, they don't want to. So they differ anything. slightly within Britain, but there's a little more uh, a little more variance like outside in the Greater European Zone. Uh, for instance, in Spain, they combine hobby horses with like these big head costumes uh, <laughs> of like saints and stuff that that carry around these phallic foam rubber clubs called verga, which yeah. they use to quote belabor onlookers. <laughs> Man, I would be really upset if somebody hit me with one of those. Dude. <laughs> I feel like I'd be super belabored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Belgium, they uh, use a large processional dragon with a long, stiff tail. And the legend says that St. George was trying to kill this dragon with a lance before getting frustrated and just uh, using a pistol instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't get it with this lance. I just got to shoot it. I can't kill this dragon. Oh, I have a pistol. Um, yeah. So this festival, which is actually called the uh, Ducasse de Mons, has actually been recognized by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, uh, as one of the masterpieces of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity, which I became (laughs) pretty interested in. So I jumped into that for a little bit. There you go. Uh, So UNESCO started establishing this list of intangible cultural heritages Uh, with the aim of ensuring better protection for them and awareness of their significance, right? Because a lot of this stuff will go away if people don't remember it. So I wasn't going to let you guys escape the episode without a list from me. So here we go. Because you were admonished. Mm, Yeah. So UNESCO actually recognizes over 350 intangible masterpieces, but I'm 
Uh, I'm only, Can you list all of them? I'm, I'm, gonna, yeah, I'm go. only going to list Number one. every single one. Number one, no. <laughs> um, I'm only going to go into a few here um, for the sake of time. Uh, the Summer Solstice Fire Festivals in the Pyrenees. Okay. Uh, in Argentina and Uruguay, the tango. Oh. Yeah. Um, I in, know that. In uh, Iran, uh, their Ira- Iranian New Year is an intangible art. Hmm. Uh, in Bangladesh... The traditional art of Jamdani weaving. Okay. Uh, in Belgium, shrimp fishing by horseback. Excuse me. What? Shrimp fishing by horseback. How I, how's that done? That's not where horses go. By horseback. <laughs> do you, Do you have like twenty minutes of info on shrimp fishing by I horseback? I don't. I don't have. Right, I don't well, have. I don't have even one minute of information about. That's it. your S. I guess so. <laughs> There we go. Uh, in Bolivia, uh, the Andean Cosmovision of the Kalawaya? Yeah, you know. You know, Cosmovision. Uh-huh. <laughs> Polyphonic singing, which, Chris, I, I think you're familiar with. Um, uh-huh. It, of the Aka Pygmies of Central Africa. Now, polyphonic singing was actually listed like literally a hundred times. Like this is yeah, uh, with a bunch of. Yeah, there's a lot of cultures that. Uh, do that like throat singing stuff pretty yeah cool. we learned uh in high school we learned tuvin throat singing yeah <laughs> i want you to send me this list uh when we're okay. done here uh chinese calligraphy chinese mm-hmm. paper cutting and the use the actual usage of the abacus are uh, on this list uh the mediterranean diet is on this list um i uh, love mediterranean food yeah uh, Dude, me too. Vedic mm, Vedic lamb. chanting in India. In Italy, okay. the celebration of big shoulder born processional structures? Excuse I don't, me? <laughs> I'm not really sure what that means. I think that's when they um like do like the parade float, but like they pick it up and carry it down the street, oh, like on those long poles. Like a litter. You know yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a Viking ship. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh Kabuki Theater in Japan. Mm-hmm. Mariachi in Mexico. One of the greatest forms of music. Exi- yep. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, the Ifa divination system. Sure. Tightrope walking in Korea. In Korea? Yeah. Which one? Uh, it just says the Republic of Korea. Okay. Uh, My- that's, <laughs> that's South Korea. Yep. Yeah. And <laughs> in Spain, the performance art of human towers. Oh yes, I've seen that. That's yeah. amazing. They're in, incredibly impressive, and yeah. flamenco. So okay, yeah. So a lot of those nice. we recognize, and they are on that list of uh, kind of it. It's it's interesting. It's kind of like a list of endangered species, but as as far as cultural heritage stuff. So that's pretty yeah, neat yeah. That it's recognized. and so what is it? So they're, they're classified as what exactly? As non uh, written or whatever? They're called uh, intangible masterpieces. Intangible, yeah. That's so I gotta very say, interesting. This is the first time that anybody has ever said the word UNESCO to me, and I let it have more than a moment's thought. And I've really been missing out. This was <laughs> super interesting, and I'm kind of bummed that i never looked into it before yeah let's get a let's get our unesco cards guys so great job united nations like that's a really admirable thing to be doing with your time Mm -hmm. uh very interesting uh but maybe not so interesting nothing here for the united states but that's because we're such a baby you know in terms of the age of our country and we just steal everything and we steal everything do it better yeah so yeah man i can't wait to figure out what it is that we do that no one else the first thing the first thing that unesco puts down for the united states it's gonna be super embarrassing fried twinkie yeah the twinkie it's uh, (laughs) a imprisoning (laughs) six-year-olds yeah so child prisoners i'll bring this right back around uh to the etymology of the term hobby horse uh because i thought it was pretty interesting the word hobby, uh, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is a small or middle-sized horse. Um, oh, in, what? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the word was actually derived from the Middle English word hobbin in the 14th century. And it connects to the by name hobbin, which is a variant of robin, which apparently was what they called their 
cart horses? Like they named all their cart horses like Robin? Nice. I don't know. Um, That's bizarre. So t- tell me about the etymology of Hobbit now. <laughs> Uh, Straight up from nope. J.R.R. Tolkien. J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, and then, like uh, Chris said earlier, the term hobby horse came from the expression to ride one's hobby horse, meaning oh. to follow a favorite pastime, which is oh. how we ended up with the modern sense of the term hobby. Huh. And there, and there we go. And that's hobby horses. I looked up um, a picture of them and was... Straight up horrified. Pretty weird, right? Real scary stuff happening. Yeah, some of the some of the pictures from the eighteen hundreds are kind of creepy too. Like, yeah, yeah. Don't don't. But need that's that it. In my dreams, I thought that was pretty interesting. That is interesting. It's interesting how how uh, dramatically everything changed. Mm-hmm. Like like the the meaning of it and how how different all of the practices were, even though they were somewhat localized. Yeah. Europe. Okay. Uh, so I'm interested. In hearing what Chris came up with this time. Are you? Are you really? I'm ready for it, Chris, and I want you to be as enthusiastic as possible. I <laughs> don't, don't <laughs> threaten me with a good time. Um, so I decided, I thought it was very obvious, and I'm also going on the alliteration route, but I think I got you a beat by one. Okay. I'm doing a, a mine on Hollywood Hulk Hogan. Ah, uh, Yes. A uh, Christian named Terry Jean uh, Bollea. He was uh, obviously a professional wrestler. I'll, I'll put that out of the way before I go into uh, a little bit about himself. So he's born in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, moved to Tampa, Florida at age one and a half. Um, born in 1953. He uh, uh, was a you know uh, just a hoss of a child. Was a little <laughs> league superstar. Was apparently like in like uh, middle school and high school. Was playing. Um, baseball still and was being scouted by the new york yankees and the cincinnati reds but had a uh, he was a pitcher he um so it doesn't really specify because i was not interested in actually reading a lot of these uh, early portions came out of his autobiography called my life outside the ring okay um and so I didn't go into that, but the details I was able to gather was that he was, you know, a, a middle schooler, high schooler playing baseball, started being scouted. Um, he had an injury. I think, I believe it was a shoulder injury, and so he was a pitcher, so that kind of ended his baseball career. So he was in Tampa, and he would go see shows at the Tampa Sportatorium. Um, and he <laughs> was a big fan of Dusty Rhodes, which is a name that I hope maybe you guys have ever heard before yeah of course um yeah dusty Rhodes was this big fat fatty but he was like one of the best on the mic he cut a promo like no other he was the one who uh would say that he was like the 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 son of a plumber and all these great things um dusty Rhodes was a big uh inspiration for him and also the um there was a guy named superstar billy graham and hogan really uh, idolized his look because billy graham was a he was a like a uh a, a uh, what do you call him? Uh, like a bodybuilder kind of body type. He wasn't the most charismatic mm-hmm. on the mic, but he was just, he looked the part really, really well. So um, Hogan throughout um, high school and uh, in college, he started attending college. He uh, played um, bass in a bunch of bands, local bands. And then he formed a band called Ruckus in 1976. He started, uh, the band became semi-successful locally. So he started actually missing classes and decided to drop out of college. Um, so he's pursuing music and he began to work out at a gym called Hector's gym. Um, while he was working out at this gym, he was still performing with ruckus and the, the, uh, bars that he was performing at a lot of the local wrestlers would be at. And he actually caught the eye just because of his natural stature. The man is six, seven. And once he started working out, put on a lot of weight. Oh my um, goodness. Yeah. He was six, seven tall drink of water playing the bass in these bands <laughs> and there were these two guys they were brothers who wrestled together in the florida region um jack and gerald briscoe but they saw hogan and they talked to him and they were like man you should do what we do so they hooked him up with this guy hiro matsuda who was a trainer for uh cwf which was championship wrestling from florida at the time so hogan started training with them but it was a it was a difficult uh issue because Whenever it got uh, brought to the uh, promoter at the time, whose name was, uh, what was it, Uh, Eddie Graham, he didn't want to let Hogan into the ring because he thought that he was too distracted with other um, 
uh, things he was pursuing, like uh, the music. So Hogan dropped his band, finally got his chance, and he suited up and wrestled for championship wrestling from Florida. So that's where Hogan starts wrestling in 1976. He uh, starts appearing under the name, what was his name? Oh, I think, no, oh, uh, the Super Destroyer was the name that he wrestled under. <laughs> so he was Terry uh, Bollea, the Super Destroyer. So he's wrestling under that name. It uh, ends up kind of becoming a wash. He uh, starts butting heads with um, his trainer, Hiro Matsuda, and said that he was overbearing. So he actually quit wrestling. In this time, huh. he starts uh, being a manager for a popular nightclub in, um, in I think it was Coconut Beach. No, Coco, uh, yeah, Coco Beach, uh, Florida, and uh, is uh, managing this private club for this man, Whitey Bridges. Um, eventually, Whitey and Hogan become close friends. I should call him Balea because he's still that right now. Um, they become close friends. They decide to open a gym together. So they open a gym, and it's called Whitey and Terry's Olympic Gym. So they're working this gym, doing a great job. Then um, while Hogan is uh, helping with this gym, this man, Ed Leslie, comes in, and he starts working out there. Um, he, him and Hogan become very good friends. Um, Hogan starts being really excited by uh, the muscular physique that this man, uh, uh, Leslie, was able to produce. And so he uh, Did you say he got him, excited? About- oh, yeah. There's a lot of this article is about men being excited about the way other men look. Um, People who are into bodybuilding are, like, really into bodybuilding. Yeah. And, like, they admire each other's muscles and, like, they try to figure out, like, how to do it. Okay. I recently, it's actually a really supportive yeah. community. I recently read something where uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's parents actually thought that he was gay when he was growing up because his walls were just covered with pictures of muscled men. Huh. I, I read that, too. Yeah. Today I learned. Um so so uh, he becomes really good friends with Ed Leslie. Ed Leslie at this time starts calling himself Brutus Beefcake. So um, <laughs> they decide that they're going to become a tag team and they're going to start wrestling again. Um, Hogan reaches out to superstar Billy Graham. Graham hooks him up with um, something outside of the Florida Territory. And so he starts wrestling for Louis Tillett's Alabama Territory. Um, so he brings, um, Ed Leslie, Brutus Beefcake with him and tells him, I'm going to teach you everything I know about the sport. So they start wrestling together and they are billed as Terry and Ed Boulder, known as the Boulder brothers. And so they start wrestling. Um, they're kind of, you know, they, they both look great. So, um, they start getting a, a name kind of built for them at this point. They're, um, seen by a man by the name of Jerry Jarrett, who is the father of Jeff Jarrett. Um, who is a wrestler and um, a lot of alliteration it it, it, there is a ton of it so that he offers them a deal where he says i can give you 800 dollars a week and they said yes that's more than the 175 dollars a week they were currently making so they accept and they go to memphis to work um during his time in memphis um terry boulder at the time is uh, on a talk show, and he's sitting next to Lou Ferrigno, who was on the television show The Incredible Hulk. Um, the yes. host of the show comments on how Terry, um, who stood six foot seven, weighed two hundred and ninety five pounds and had twenty four inch biceps, sitting next to Lou Ferrigno, who played the Hulk, actually dwarfed him. And so uh, Jerry Jarrett's wife, Mary Jarrett, is backstage, and she's also with the um, the company. She says, yeah, you're way bigger than Ferrigno is. Um, we need to change your name. So uh, <laughs> this is not – you don't have proper adjectives going on here. Yeah, so, so Terry Balea starts um, wrestling under the name Terry the Hulk Boulder. And also at this time, for some reason, and this is there's no uh, elaboration on this, he also wrestles under the name Sterling Golden. <laughs> so uh, it, by this point, it's uh, 1979. He has a couple championship matches. He actually starts his feud with Andre the Giant at this point, and they go on in 1980 to wrestle in Shea Stadium, not for a title, but just um, it's like was a big uh, kind of figurehead match that was happening around the same time. The WWWF has a deal with something called New Japan Pro Wrestling, and this is obviously in Japan, and uh, they send, um, at the time his name was was Terry the Hulk Boulder, to go wrestle in New Japan Pro. The Japanese fans start referring to him as, as Ichiban, which translates to number one. 
Right. And Number he one. becomes yeah, he becomes a huge star over there and he beats like Abdullah the Butcher and he's he's uh kind of learning a lot of his um his uh, signature moves, the running leg drop, the uh, uh crooked arm lariat which he calls the axe bomber. He learns a lot of his moves and he starts challenging for titles over there and then he actually is involved in the first International Wrestling Grand Prix Championship, which is the IWGP uh tournament and he um wins by defeating and this name might be familiar to you gentlemen and hopefully at a later date to the our, our listeners he defeats antonio inoki oh by... yes <laughs> he defeats the him whole podcast was worth so it. <laughs> for those that don't you obviously don't no, know um we did a pilot episode of the show just to kind of warm ourselves up and uh, antonio inoki was chris's first article so article yeah so he beats antonio inoki by knockout he wins the title um, at this point, this is this is like all fast forward now because now we go blast through time. Um, 1981, uh, Hogan appears in the movie Rocky Three, which I still hold to be one of the greatest movies ever made because you have Mr. T and Hulk Hogan acting in the same movie. Mm. Um, Mr. T literally yells at a person to death. Um, but Hogan's <laughs> in it as a professional wrestler in the in the movie by the name of Thunderlips. This is when Hogan kind of really starts making a name for himself. He uh, wins a match, and Gorilla Monsoon, who was the uh, commentator at the time, um, this is when uh, Hogan beat, I think, Bob Backlund for the first time. Um, Gorilla Monsoon says that Hulkamania is here. Um, uh, Vincent Kennedy McMahon is also, or, yeah, Vincent uh, J. McMahon is also the person who gave Hogan the last name Hogan because he had a weird thing for Irish last names. Go figure. He okay. also he also requested that Hogan dye his hair red, and Hogan said his hair was falling out already at the time, so he didn't want to do it. Oh, no. But he just continued to bleach it for his entire life, which, you know, is just as healthy. Um, Hogan, you know, obviously goes on great title runs. He gets some international renown. He starts um, appearing in a lot of different things. Um, he tag teams with um, the Macho Man Randy Savage at, at uh, in 1988. And they form a group called the the Mega Powers, and this is from eighty eight to eighty nine. There's a um, you know a lot of uh, uh, prestige that goes with to that group because they were the two kind of biggest uh, personalities at the time. Right, right. Um, this also goes on to a little bit of scandal, which I'll touch on in a moment. Hogan has a championship run from nineteen ninety eight to nineteen ninety two. He um, decides to leave the company in nineteen ninety three. Hogan goes and starts wrestling for WCW, and it was a big kind of um, to-do because it was the biggest guy from WWF is now wrestling for the competition. Um, this is begins a thing called the Monday Night Wars, which I won't really go into, but it's when wrestling uh, entered this thing called the Attitude Era, which was like the new stars were like The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin with WWF, and WCW at the time had a lot of um, bought talent. They bought a lot of talent off of WWF because they were offering these guaranteed contracts where the people got a guaranteed amount of money whether they showed or not. It was it was a bunch of nonsense. Hogan's deal actually, he had creative control, so he got to dictate what matches he won and storylines and stuff like that. But then they brought in other people and gave multiple people creative control and it started this just obviously that's a horrible idea because you're going to have conflicting ideas and you're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. Hogan goes on. He's uh, uh, the champion a bunch of times. He has uh, feuds with um, with uh, uh, Macho Man. He actually betrays him and joins this thing called the NWO. He actually has a lot of conflicts with the man who's the current um, head writer for WCW at the time. And there's a moment where Hogan was supposed to lose the belt to a man named Jeff Jarrett, who is the son of uh, the – what did I say? Jimmy Jarrett? Whatever Jerry his name Jarrett. Was? Jerry Jarrett. Yeah. Um, Jerry, uh, Jerry. Hogan's, yeah, Hogan says he doesn't want to lose the belt to Jeff Jarrett, and uh, Vince Russo then tells Jeff Jarrett, okay, if he doesn't want to uh, lose the belt to you, you go out to the ring, and this is all on live TV, you go to the ring, and when the match starts, just lay down on the ground and don't fight him, because if he's not going to give us what we want, we're not going to let him look good. So that happens on live TV. This is the actual, like, how bad the animosity was between all these people. 
Hogan the audience yeah. just like start booing. <laughs> yeah, the crowd was not into it. So um, yeah. WCW ends up losing the Monday Night Wars. WWF buys them out. So Hogan ends up returning to WWE. He comes back. He does a character named Mr. America at one point where he just <laughs> wears an American flag mask and does all of Hulk Hogan's moves and comes out to Hulk Hogan's original Real Americans theme. So the whole thing's a mess. He uh, uh, has some uh, troubles with... Um, uh the wwf he leaves again he returns to new japan wrestles there for 2003 goes and wrestles for a rival promotion called tna wrestling total non-stop action wrestling and he wrestles for, with them from 2003 to 2004 ends up getting inducted into the wwf hall of fame in 2005 and comes back and stays with them until 2007 he uh, leaves goes back to tna <laughs> And then uh, comes back to the WWE for the fourth time and is kind of in a backstage capacity. He's hosting a lot of things. He wanted to be involved in WrestleMania 30 is happening. It's a big landmark occasion. And Hogan's actually lined up to um, – he's the host of a, a reality TV show called um, Total uh, or Tough Enough where people compete to get a WWE contract. At this exact moment is when Scandal starts hitting, and Hulk Hogan, there's a sex tape that is released, and in this sex tape, he uh, is hurt. So the sex tape is bizarre because, number one, it's a sex tape between Hogan and one of his very good friend's wives that is being secretly recorded, and um, it was at the... um, the with the go ahead from the best friend who went by the name of Bubba the Love Sponge. He's a um a radio DJ in Florida. It so uh, sounds he like said, a radio yeah, no, DJ name. Yeah, go ahead, have sex with my wife. Hogan uh, does that, but during it, he's like answering phone calls from his like his family, and he's what? talking about how much he loves his son. And what? then he starts yes, and then he starts telling the the lady he's sleeping with that he's really upset that his uh, daughter is dating a black guy, and he actually uses the n word. This and is so this is all like during coitus on a sex date. Well, no, there's lots of breaks. Oh, um, oh, okay. <laughs> At this point, he's a hundred years. I, old. Yeah, I thought this was like during the act, and I was like, <laughs> "No, no, no!" What kind of tape is this? It's very bizarre. So, anyways, the, uh, he ends up getting fired or let go from the WWE because they obviously couldn't have that controversy uh, around uh-uh. them. It was met by by a lot of like the, st- strange reactions because there were some um, African American wrestlers who had been working with him and around him, and they were like, um, "This guy Virgil said Hogan's never given me a reason to think he's racist." Dennis Rodman said he's most certainly not a racist. Um, and then there's other people who were still with the WWE who said, you know, I'm really happy that this is the way that they responded to this. There should be a no tolerance approach to racism and stuff like that. So, anyways, that's kind of the the drama that happened there. So he gets let go. Um, other things that happened in Hulk Hogan's life is <laughs> he in 1995 he opened up a, a restaurant in the Mall of America called Hulk Hogan's Pasta Mania. <laughs> so that's a thing that existed at a time. <laughs> He also was on The Tonight Show, and he's mentioned this on The Tonight Show and on uh, Conan, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, that he said that the George Foreman grill was originally offered to Hogan, and he he didn't respond in time, so George Foreman got to endorse it instead. But um, I would have definitely bought a Hulk Hogan He didn't grill. get to his, oh, his sir, email you, in time. You didn't, because what happened after that was after the success of the Foreman grill, Hogan went on to endorse a blender that was known as Hulk Hogan's Thunder Mixer. And then since then, he's also endorsed a grill known as the Hulk Hogan Ultimate Grill. Um, oh, so that happened. Well. He's gone on to uh, uh, endorse uh, energy drinks and a line of uh, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, and chicken sandwiches that were sold at Walmart that were called Hulkster Burgers. Um, so he's kind of like he's had a, a very strange career. He's acted in a lot of things. Uh, um, a movie apparently called Santa with Muscles. A he was in the third uh, Three Ninjas. High Noon at Mega Mountain. There was a lot of uh, uh, interesting stuff that he was involved in, but I think it was it was the the he. It seems like he was always his own worst enemy. He was going and and kind of fighting his uh, his uh, uh, own success with with like either leaving companies or having s- strange squabbles. Um, he's also gone on. So the the Gawker lawsuit happened recently, which was the website that uh, posted the the sex tape. Um, it, they. Uh, uh, did that with you know no regard to anything they didn't check with anybody and get permission from anybody and posted it with by saying who it was and and what was going on so uh 
with that uh, scandal, he sued Gawker and sued them for, what was it? I think $100 million in damages is what oh. he uh, sued for. Uh, uh, for uh, defamation of character, loss of privacy, and emotional pain. I'm going to guess and, probably didn't win that case. Okay, so on March 18th, <sighs> 2016, he was awarded $115 million. What? This bankrupted Gawker. Gawker no longer exists. And also what has... Uh, Hold I've on read... a second. This whole Gawker yes, thing that just happened was because of Hulk Hogan? Yeah, yeah, because of Hulk Hogan's sex tape. They posted it with no um, regard for I didn't for read too far anything. into this, but that is incredibly bizarre. Yes, so they uh, are, you know, they bankrupted the company. They had to pay him everything. But then the very interesting thing is the man who was in charge of Gawker, the judge has actually okayed um, his personal property to be levied and given to um, Hogan as part of the payment. Wow. So Hogan's like received cars and like uh, real estate. Wow. So there's a lot of weird stuff. Um, Hogan uh, also had a reality TV show for a short amount of time called Hogan Knows Best. His family was on it. Mm-hmm. It was a Father's Knows Best uh, spoof. He, um, his, him and his wife have since separated. And this is just the final little tidbit I want to leave you on just to leave a very bad taste in your mouth. Okay. And that is that. So Hulk Hogan currently is 63. He yes. is now married to a woman who is 42. So that is a 21-year age difference. Yeah. Which, you know, it's it's a lot. But it could be both worse, older right? And, yeah, exactly. Um, Hulk Hogan's daughter and son, so Brooke Hogan and Nick Hogan, are 28 and 26, respectively. So th- there still is a 14-year difference between uh, Hulk Hogan's wife and daughter and a 16-year difference between his wife and... Um, Okay, so and still son. within the 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 realm yeah, of it's 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 okay. The one disconcerting thing is, and if you want to look it up, look up like Hulk Hogan Jennifer McDaniel, because uh, that's his wife's name. Um, she looks alarmingly like his daughter. Oh, so that's real strange. Hulk so Hogan. I am. I googled Jennifer McDaniel after you brought that up. Uh-huh. Click Google Images, and one of the suggested. Uh, additional searches was looks like Brooke Hogan. Yep. So I clicked it and I see a picture of them together and I pretty much can't tell who is who. Exactly. Wow. It is it's, it's disconcerting. They look they look pretty similar. Okay. Hulk Hogan. Oh, I'm I don't like how I feel. <laughs> Hulk Hogan meant a lot he to me. Was when I was a I, he, did, he, he was a hero. He did He was my favorite wrestler. Didn't mean a yeah. lot to me. Well, you know, I was from the South, and yeah. wrestling was a big deal, right? Like, all the kids were into it. Uh, WWF, now E, uh-huh. was huge at the time. Hulk Hogan was the man. Yep. You know, and I used to try to, like, tear my shirts <laughs> like he would do. But uh, it's really difficult to tear a shirt, um, even as an adult man. <laughs> Um, you want to know a secret? The, he always had the He cuts cut. it, right? Yeah. yeah. They had a yeah. little cut at the top. That's what makes all the difference. Yeah. I don't know if I could rip a shirt uh, without cutting it right now. Yeah. I'm not going to try, though. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take us out. Are we good? Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, so, once again, I'd like to thank everybody for listening. And please... Please engage us on social media. <laughs> um, we've gotten to the point where I can see that you're doing it, and it makes me feel really good every time we get a new Yeah, it's really, really, um, it's really encouraging, and we want to thank everybody for jumping in there and doing that. Yes, very much. Yeah, so uh, check us out. Uh, like our page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at underscore wiki wiki what. Uh, visit <laughs> our website, wiki wiki what podcast. Dot com, or send us feedback or suggestions at wikiwikiwetpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah, and I, I guess got to thank everybody once again for really, really helping us spread the word. Uh, one of the most important things you can do is actually uh, subscribe on iTunes and rate us on iTunes. That is one of the only ways that you can kind of climb the charts there and get a little bit more exposure. Uh Definitely follow our Twitter. Try and get that out there. Um, our Facebook is beating out our Twitter uh, pretty handily, but we could always use more. 
Um, yeah, but just thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun, and we we hope you guys are enjoying it. Yes, we enjoy doing it. We we thank everybody. I uh, personally, I've made the offer, and I stand by it. That if you like us on Facebook or subscribe and, and rate us on iTunes, I'm going to prepare the most special hug for you. So just let me know after you've done it, and I will deliver. And hey, it's 3 a.m. Stop reading Wikipedia and go to bed. Oh,